Hi, I'm Stephen with Alberta Urban Garden.ca. Two weeks ago in the Testing Garden Assumptions series, I set up an experiment to evaluate actively aerated compost tea and compost extractions, primarily to see if they had value as a fertilizer and if the methods allowed you to increase the concentrations of bacteria. The two claims I took a look at are not the only ones made by advocates of compost tea. Today I will investigate the other claims made about compost tea before making a decision at the end of this video if I am going to continue or abandon the practice in my garden. Right out the gate I am going to touch on commercial compost tea products. The products that you can often find in the store are essentially soluble fertilizers masquerading as compost teas. Any positive results that you may see within the garden are much more likely due to the fertilizer content and far less likely to any bacteria that may be within the product. These products may cause a misconception that by adding bacteria you are going to see great results, when in all likelihood it is much more likely that it is going to be the fertilizer content. So for today's episode I am going to talk about home brewed compost teas. The first claim I would like to look at is why you would want to culture bacteria using actively aerated compost tea methods. Our experiment did not show the methods increased bacterial concentrations as both the rainwater and the compost already had so many. I postulated last episode that by using rainwater and compost in your garden you may already be adding enough bacteria to your soil. If for some reason you did not feel that you had enough bacteria, could you use this method to increase the concentrations of bacteria within your garden? Molasses and actively aerated compost tea serves the same purpose as agar which is derived from kelp and makes up the growth medium in petri dishes. Agar is used in the lab to culture bacteria. They provide the nutrients required and can be quite selective for a specific type of bacteria or a wide range. In an actively aerated compost tea, if the method actually does work and it increases bacterial concentrations, it is going to blanket increase bacterial concentrations. Any bacteria that respond to the method will have the opportunity to rise in concentrations. And I have some pretty big concerns about doing this. You and I likely don't know which bacteria are beneficial for the nutrient cycle and the ones that are may not respond to an actively aerated compost tea method. In fact, we may be culturing bacteria that can cause disease and illness in plants and humans alike. The AACT method may inadvertently allow you to culture E. coli or salmonella or something much worse. Coming into contact with these bacteria in low concentrations is perfectly safe, however if you come into higher concentrations they may have the potential to make you sick. The only way that this method could be safe is if you had a proper microscope and sufficient training in order to identify what you are culturing. In fact, compost tea's largest advocate, Dr. Ingham, does not think that people should be using compost tea unless it is tested for pathogens. On this point, compost tea's largest advocate is in complete agreement with its largest critic, Dr. Jeff Gilman. Following some research, I would like to touch on a few other of the common benefits attributed to the use of compost tea in the garden. But first, I would like to draw special attention to Dr. Linda Chalker Scott, whom has done a wonderful job researching and writing information bulletins on a wide variety of subjects. Make sure to check out her work on the Garden Professor's blog and or the Facebook page. Before I move on to evaluating the claims about compost tea, I would first like to talk about the scientific method and Occam's razor and how it guides my decisions. The scientific method is a manner in which you come up with a question or a hypothesis and you devise a way to test it. Once you have your results that are either supportive, refuting or null, you may end up with multiple different ways to explain those results that you got. This is the time that you rely on Occam's razor. Essentially, Occam's razor is a theory where competing hypotheses or ways to explain things, often the one with the fewest assumptions must be used. So essentially, the simplest way to explain a result is likely the most correct. An example of this principle is if someone is using compost tea in the garden and sees a benefit. It could be because of the addition of bacteria and nutrients from the compost tea or it could be simply more consistent watering. Consistent moisture in the soil is a well established benefit to plants, whereas there are a lot more variables that impact the nutrient content and the bacterial numbers that cast doubt that this is the explanation why one may see improvements in production in the garden. 
If you have poor soil, some claim that by using compost tea, it will help to improve the soil structure over time. If you do see positive results, it is more likely due to the consistent watering, helping you overcome the shortfalls of water retention in your soil. If you do not see positive results, then it's much more likely due to the lack of organic material in the soil. Adding bacteria and nutrients to soil that can't hold them will likely result in the death of the bacteria and the leaching of the nutrients. Essentially, it's like tossing your favorite plant into the desert and walking away. It may live for a while, but it is unlikely to have a lasting positive impact on the desert. A few of you had mentioned compost tea may be useful to initially inoculate new garden soils. To this I would respond, if you provide a good habitat, beneficial organisms will inoculate the soil by themselves. Beneficial organisms are already well adapted to the environment and likely are already in your garden. In fact, it is very important to actually allow the beneficial organisms to inoculate on their own as they'll create a stable ecosystem in the soil. If we try to do it, we may inadvertently unbalance that ecosystem and expose us to more risk. Another claim that often catches the attention of many gardeners is advocates showing off their giant harvests and attributing it to compost tea use. There is a much simpler explanation with far fewer assumptions. Let's circle back to the environmental conditions within your garden. If you provide consistent watering and your soil has all the nutrients the plants need, they're going to grow larger than the plants grown that get inconsistent watering and may have a deficiency in the soil. And the second explanation that could be used is plant genetics. Through a process called selective breeding, you can over time select for seeds that are in the largest of the crops and continue to do that. And over time, that strain will actually increase in size. A great example of this is giant pumpkins. You can either get a thousand pound pumpkin from the same variety or a 30 pound pumpkin from the same variety. And that's all through a process called selective breeding. Often advocates of compost tea indicate that you should apply it to the leaves. Another term for this is foliar application. The statement that plants can actually take up nutrients through their leaves in the stoma, which is underneath the leaf, in the form of minerals, is in fact correct. This method is effective in cases where the soil is deficient, such as many high-intensity agricultural operations. Often in those cases, they have a lot more information about the crop, soil, and environment so that the method can be successfully applied. Most home gardeners are likely not going to go to the expense to get the required information. And I would be willing to bet most home gardens that are amended with compost are not significantly lacking any of the nutrients that are required. And why would you take on the risk of brewing a compost tea that may be applying pathogens to plants that you are going to touch or eat? The second claim made about the foliar application of compost tea is that it helps fight or resist diseases. This statement is supported by plenty of products and advocates all throughout social media and is touted as sound science. While it is still early in the research, these claims may be overstated. In a paper published in the American Phytopathology Society, they tested a number of methods and while most failed, some methods did show significant improvements in the resistance of grey mould on geraniums. Without knowing a lot about your compost, plants, compost tea methods and disease issues, it's more likely you're not going to get the results you want while increasing the chances that you may actually be spraying a pathogen on your plants once again. There are plenty of other claims made about the foliar application of different products, but that's fodder for another episode. A few of my patio gardening friends asked about using compost tea in their containers as the soil may not be able to support a healthy nutrient cycle. Providing the compost as a nutrient source is a good idea. That said, there is a simple method. Simply mix fresh compost into the potting soil or apply it as a mulch. It will save you the brewing process and the risks while allowing you to deposit the nutrients where they are needed. In summary, neither actively aerated compost tea nor compost extractions had significant value as a fertilizer and they did not increase the concentration of bacteria when using rich finished compost and rainwater as recommended by advocates. Some of you may be asking if this labor-intensive process simply helps you provide optimal conditions in your garden. And as such, if you can replace this labor-intensive process with something a little easier and still get all the same benefits. 
If you simply apply that same compost or vermicompost to your mulch layer and water on a regular basis, you will provide optimal growth conditions for beneficial organisms that will run the nutrient cycle and feed your plants. Consequently, your plants will be able to reach their genetic potential and produce more while resisting diseases. I am going to formally abandon the use of actively aerated compost tea and compost extractions in my garden. The other methods that I've been evaluating in the Testing Garden Assumption series have proven to be supported with fewer risks. By using mulch and compost made with free and local resources, I am likely providing the optimal conditions for plant growth and the nutrient cycle, resulting in larger harvests with little effort.